Morning, church. Good to see you all here this morning. Blessings to our members and visitors. If you're visiting with us, then we want to invite you back. Any opportunity that you have. Uh, if you see one of those cards in front of you and you're a first-time visitor, we would love it if you fill that out. And you can either give that to me in the back of the auditorium after services over or you can put it in one of the black boxes there that you see at the back of the auditorium. That's just so we can get to know you and you can get to know us and we can express our appreciation for you being here this morning with us here at Highland Heights. In our series entitled Satisfied, Learning to be Content in Jesus, we've, we've been talking about the sweet satisfaction that is only found in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives all grace bringing all satisfaction, equipping us for every good work. In Him, we find great gain. And when our hearts are growing in our capacity to be content in Him and Him alone, we're able to worship with greater fervor. We're able to serve with greater zeal. We're able to flee temptation, to indulge in inferior pleasures, and bring glory and honor to His name in a way that He truly deserves when we are satisfied in Him. This morning is going to be our final lesson in our series, and then we're going to move on to something else. We're going to be diving into Psalm 37. Psalm 37. So I greatly encourage you to take out your Bible uh, and turn there with me. Psalm 37. We're going to be looking specifically at verse 4. Verse 4. And we're going to feast together on the uh, satisfying spiritual truths that are embedded within. First of all, look with me in verse 1 of Psalm 37. Verse 1. The ESV renders it like this, Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. Now the verb rendered fret here in Hebrew, it, it carries the idea, it carries a hint of anger to it. It's the kind of fretting or the kind of worrying that one experiences when they aren't exactly sure if they're going to receive justice or not. If they're going to receive what's fair. And, and maybe they believe that the wicked are going to go unpunished and triumph over them and get what they deserve. Many times we see this kind of fretting uh, within the Psalms and elsewhere in the Bible, uh, the righteous are tempted to look upon those that are wicked who prosper over them uh, with a hint of anger and say, they don't deserve what they're getting. They don't deserve the good that's coming to them. I do. I deserve good. I deserve to prosper. And that's what the Bible refers to as envy. Notice with me what the psalmist in Psalm 73, verses 2 through 5 says. Psalm 73, verse 2 through 5. King Asaph says, But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They're not in trouble as others are. They're not stricken like the rest of mankind. Our human hearts are extremely sensitive to injustice. We are extremely sensitive to injustice, especially injustices that are directed toward us. When we see or perceive that someone is taking something from us, using us in some way to their gain and our harm, prospering over us when we believe that we deserve better than what they have and what they're getting, we cry out, that's not fair. That's not fair. It's not fair that I didn't get picked to be on the ball team when all the other kids got picked. It's not fair that I've been 
working like a dog in my job for years and years and years. And they, pr they promote someone else outside of the company to a greater position than I have. It's not fair that my kids always seem to have problems, behavior problems, health problems, developmental problems, but other people's kids, they seem to be healthy. They seem to be fine. They seem to be growing. It's just not fair that everyone around me seems so happy and joyful all the time, but me, I'm wallowing in misery and despair and grief, it seems like, every waking moment. It's a natural human experience to long for what is fair, what is right, and what is good. And, 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 and many times when, when, when we are on the receiving end of a seeming injustice, we look upon those who have slighted us or prospered over us and say in our hearts, they don't deserve that. They don't deserve the good that's coming to them. I do. I deserve to prosper in their place. That's envy. That's what the Bible calls envy. A simmering kind of anger and resentment and bitterness directed towards someone who's prospering when we are collapsing, when we're declining, when we are failing. Envy is an expression of a dissatisfied heart. Envy is an expression of a dissatisfied heart. When envy creeps in because of the success of others, it's a sure indication that our hearts don't really believe that we have enough. It's a sure sign that we're dissatisfied with all of the abundance that God has given to us by His grace and by His mercy, and we believe that more is required to sustain. Envy is most likely something that every single one of us has been tempted with and has given in to at times, including the psalmist uh, we see within uh, the pages of the text. Uh, but notice with me what David continues to say in Psalm 37, verse 2. Psalm 37, verse 2. For they, the wicked, those that prosper, they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Now, as we look at the scope of Psalm 37, the whole point, uh, the, the, whole, the, the whole point of Psalm 37 is, is to say, look, you don't have to be envious. You, you don't have to be envious of anyone. You don't have to be envious of, of the wicked that seemingly prosper over you because God is just and He will give to them what they deserve eventually. You don't have to be envious at all because even when it seems like people are prospering over you and, and receiving what you deserve, when you remain in the Lord, this is the point of the psalm, you have all sufficiency. You have everything. You have delights beyond measure at your fingertips, and the Lord will graciously give to you each and every desire that is stored up in your heart. So don't be envious. The Lord is enough. This psalm is a plea to fight against the temptation to envy, and one of the ways that we do that, there's, a, there's a many different uh, aspects to this, to this psalm, ways we fight envy, how we counter that. Um, but one specific thing that I want to hone in on, and that's in verse 4. Uh, look with me there. Verse 4. How we wage war against this envious dissatisfaction that is encompassed in the natural human experience. Look with me in the first part of verse 4 of Psalm 37. First of all, the psalmist says, delight yourself. He says, delight yourself. Now, in the Hebrew, the verb rendered delight is in the Hithpael imperative. Uh, this signifies a command. The psalmist is saying, don't fret, don't be envious because of evildoers, but instead, rather, pursue delight in another direction. 
to battle envy. He's saying, channel your delights, your pleasures, your joys, your hopes, your dreams, your longings toward a certain thing, toward a certain person, the psalmist says. Look, notice what he says in the rest of the first half of, the, of verse 4. Delight yourself, who? Delight yourself in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord. Several years ago, Oprah Winfrey was on The Lake Show with Stephen Colbert, and Colbert asked Oprah what her favorite Bible verse was. And she actually quoted our psalm this morning, Psalm 37, verse 4, um, on The Late Show. And this is what she said. This is a direct quote. She said, Delight thyself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And she says, here's what that says to me. Lord has a wide range of meaning. What is Lord, she asks? Compassion, love, forgiveness, kindness. So, she says, you delight yourself in those virtues where the character of the Lord is revealed. She says, delight yourself in compassion, love, goodness, forgiveness, kindness, etc., etc., and you will receive the desires of your heart. She defines Lord as a vague and abstract virtues or qualities which, which are completely detached from a person, completely detached from a personal living being. And that gives her the justification to legitimize all world religions that emphasize these pleasant attributes and qualities. And so many people in the world today, even sometimes us Christians, do the same thing. Define the Lord this way. However, this psalm is, is not a plea to delight in abstract, vague attributes, vague qualities, but rather in a person in a personal living being who possesses certain attributes, who possesses certain character traits and qualities, compassion, love, goodness, forgiveness, kindness, etc., etc. I want to read several passages that reveal this person to us. Isaiah 53, 11, out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, Make many to be accounted righteous, and he, and he shall bear their iniquities. Psalm 61.10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. In the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 5, Consequently, He, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, a personal being, a person, is able to save to the uttermost, completely, those who draw near to God through Him, since He always lives to make intercession for them. And then finally, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 through 18, When I saw Him... I fell at my feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I'm the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death in Hades. We're commanded to delight in this being, not abstract vague qualities that are completely detached from a person. This person, this God, who out of the anguish of his soul has made many to be accounted righteous, who has clothed us with the garments of salvation, making us beautiful and pure like a bride or a bridegroom on the wedding day. This God who has saved 
us fully and completely and brings us into the presence of the Almighty, allows us to draw into the presence of the Holy God as our faithful high priest. This God who has the power and the right to take my life and cast it away from him. But instead, he lays his hand gently on my shoulders and he says, Fear not, I have defeated death for you so that you have no reason to fear or be afraid anymore. As we continue to see this God this person, this personal living being, and experience this God through His Word, we shouldn't have any problem with delighting in Him. Notice what the psalmist says in Psalm 36, verses 7 through 8. How precious is your steadfast love, O God! The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. As I think about what brings me delight, I think about my family. I experience delight when I'm with them to a far greater degree than I experience delight when I'm indulging in material things or um, things of this world. That, and that, that's, how, that's how human beings were created. We find superior delights in people, in those who possess a mind, emotions, and a will, those that we can share affections with and draw closer to over time. And, and, and oh, how, how blessed we are to be under command to pursue delight in the one who gives superior delight in the one who invites us to take refuge in the shadow of his wings the one who invites us to feast on the abundance of his house and the one who offers us to drink from the river of his delights However, so many Christians today, um, that I've seen at least, uh, they don't obey this command to delight in God because they aren't even sure if this God is for them. They aren't even sure if this God has their best interest at heart, their best interest in mind. I've heard Christians say things like in their, in their thoughts, He's against me. He's against me. Everything that I do, he's, he's always disappointed in me. He's never going to accept me. Brothers and sisters, trying to muster up delight in a God like that is going to be impossible. God isn't against you. God is for you. He wants you to rest safe in his arms for an eternity. And if you have trouble believing that, if that belief, if you believe it intellectually but it doesn't grasp hold of your heart, which is so oftentimes happens, then fixate your heart, your eyes, your mind, every part of you on the cross of Jesus Christ every single day, and that will point you to an accurate picture of the God, of our God that we worship and serve. Now, going back to the psalm, this is how we wage war against envious dissatisfaction. We take focus off of what has been taken from us from the prosperity of others around us, from the injustice that we have received due to living in the world, a world filled with sin and strife. And we drink every single day from the well of delights that are found in the Lord, that are found 
in this person, this being, this blessed Savior, this precious Redeemer. And when we do this, when we delight ourselves in the Lord, each and every desire that we have stored up in our hearts, He will graciously pour out upon us at our feet. Notice with me what the psalmist says lastly in the, uh, in the second half of the psalm. Psalm 30, I'm going to read the whole thing. Psalm 37, verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and what will happen? What will He do? And He will give you the desires of your heart. Now, does this text mean that if you delight yourself in the Lord, then He's going to give you a brand new bass boat? Uh, if, you, if you delight yourself in the Lord, that He's going to give you a brand new car or a new girlfriend or whatever that you really want in, in, in the moment that fits your personal, carnal, whatever desires. Uh, no, <laughs> that's not what uh, the psalmist is getting at here. Rather, the text implies that as we delight ourselves in this God, this person, this being, our desires over time will begin to parallel His will. They will be molded and shaped into what He desires. As I delight myself in this God, then what my heart wants more than anything will become what His heart wants more than anything. As I delight myself in this God, in this being. Notice what Jesus says in John 15, verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever, whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. As I, as I abide in this God and delight in this God, His glory, it becomes precious to me. And my life and, and, and His glory becomes a delight to, to magnify in all areas of, of, of my life. As I delight in this God, those that He loves, those, th those that He has affections for, become objects of my own love and affections. As I delight in this God, the advancement of His kingdom becomes my heart's pursuit. As I delight in this God, I become more capable to turn away from temptation, from to reject inferior pleasures and delights. As I delight in this God, unity amongst believers becomes an overarching goal to maintain even when those aren't too loving to me. And, what does the text say? He will freely give us those desires as we delight in Him. I hope everyone in this room can see uh, how beautiful this psalm is. Uh, when we're tempted to envy another, another person and live in dissatisfaction, God graciously commands us to redirect our focus from our seeming lack of sufficiency and the seeming prosperity of others, what they have, and commands us to seek delight in Him, which will transform what we really want in life into every desire of His heart. And He will freely and graciously give you each and every single desire so that you are fulfilled and cared for each and every day. The more that I see this Jesus, the more that I understand Him and grow in knowledge of Him, this beautiful and precious Savior, this God, the less I desire pleasures of this world, the less I desire what other people have and the more I desire Him. Because only true and lasting satisfaction may be found through Him. 
This morning, if you have any need, if you wish prayers from the church, if you're hurting in some way and we can, um, we can be of, of support to you, if we can bear your burdens, uh, or if, if, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ um, and you believe that He is the Son of God, you repent of your sins, of everything that you've ever done, um, or to do, make a decision to do a 180 right now. Uh, you have an opportunity right now. You can come forward this morning and you can confess faith in Jesus and you can be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins and begin a relationship with him. Start things fresh and know him more intimately or more fully. And, and we know that uh, coming forward in front of a crowd of people is kind of intimidating. And if you feel that way, uh, please talk to one of our elders. Um, talk to, you can talk to, talk to me um, uh, and, uh, in any way that we can serve you. Um, please let it be known. Come forward uh, this morning if you have need as we stand and as we sing.